Hi, my name is Stephanie Kamalang, and this is my lecture called Paradise Lives in the Ruins of Colonial and Dictatorship Architecture. Paradise is a fictional recurring character in my recent films. She has been voiced by my boyfriend's 10-year-old daughter, but mostly by my mother. I record her through Skype. Her disembodied voice becomes both near and far. The crackle of internet static coming through. Paradise is female. She is from a tropical climate and moves around a lot. She is a ghost who moves through space and time, but the audience never sees her. She has non-human abilities, telepathy, teleportation, time travel, but she also shares human ones. She quotes Justin Bieber. She writes poetry. She craves a community. She talks about being in ex existential ruts. She is looking for home, and she indexes all that home means. Paradise is a cleaner or an exorcist of sorts. She is a cyborg who scans the ruins of the past and the present. She is an emotional laborer for the living and dead souls, an advisor, an ultimate caregiver. In my film, she is played by a drone. I like the way this machinery moves as it can mimic both human motion yet still contain a robotic uncanniness a sensation akin to watching Sophia, the AI robot. I like utilizing the drone because I can subvert what it was originally meant for, surveillance and war, to create new narratives, both feminizing and humanizing it. I like giving it a personality that I can relate to. I've been putting paradise in harsh environments, environments where the residual ghosts of dictators and colonizers still linger in the ruins. On recent trips back to the Philippines, where my parents are from, there are a couple of places that Paradise keeps returning to. The Manila Film Center is one. This towering structure is a part of the cultural center of the Philippines, which are a cluster of seaside buildings erected between the late 1960s to the early 1980s under the Imelda and Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship in Manila. These complexes were built under the auspices to enrich and grow the Filipino cultural imagination and to transform Manila into a city that could rival its Western counterparts. These striking brutalist buildings butt up against the existing structures of Manila, right away othering themselves as symbols of money, power, and the Western ideal. Amidst the terror of the Marcos era, Imelda's grand scheme was to cultivate culture for the Filipino people. The film center itself and all the buildings within this cluster which were to be fashioned after the mega buildings of the classical era, literally copies of the Parthenon in Athens. It was with these deranged ideas that Imelda thought to build a new Filipino identity built on truth, beauty, and goodness. Alongside the tenets of classical beauty, she thought to bring Hollywood to the Philippines. Construction of the Manila Film Center started in 1981 with a slotted opening date for January 1982. Imelda envisioned a Cannes Film Festival of Asia and the 58,000 square meter structure was completed in under 400 days. Since Imelda's deadline for the building was tight, it required over 4,000 workers working in three shifts across 24 hours. 1,000 workers constructed the lobby in 72 hours, a job that would normally take six weeks of, of labor. Because of Imelda's urgency to open the film center, an accident occurred. Scaffolding collapsed during construction and 169 workers fell and were buried under quick drying cement. To prevent a national scandal, the Marcoses ordered under no circumstance was anything to be said to the press until they figured out what to say and how to say it. No emergency or medical would be allowed on the site, it was ordered. And the men and women who were buried stay, stayed buried for nine hours until the Marcoses had finally come up with a written statement. It wasn't until then that the rest of the workers were able to pick out the bodies and possible survivors but by this time, much of the cement had already dried and most were buried alive. If you Google Manila Film Center today, the top posts read, the Manila Film Center, a paranormal guide, the horrifying mystery of Manila's haunted cinema, 
the ghosts in Manila Film Center. I remember stories from both of my parents who fled the Philippines to immigrate to Canada in the 70s under, under the Marcos's regime, that the building was filled with ghosts, and not complacent ghosts, but angry ones. Ghosts who needed to be vindicated for an unjust loss of life. Loud screams were often heard by guards day or night. Things would fall from ceilings, or you could see objects being thrown from out of nowhere, they said. Multiple fires and a string of events would prevent this building from ever being used in a successful way. Visiting the building today feels like visiting an ancient ruin, except without the upkeep and maintenance you would perhaps see in places like Italy or Greece. It is literally crumbling in the tropical heat. It stands alone against the Manila Bay with no other competing structures. It remains empty with a few sleepy guards and stray dogs lingering around. After the tragedy under the Marquises, the building was cursed. It managed to open for Imelda's Film Festival, but only after the second year, the government pulled back funds. In the early 90s, a huge earthquake destroyed the building with no one to look after it, and it was left abandoned. In 2001, the Filipino government took to rehabilitate the building and afterwards leased it to a theater company called Amazing Theater Production. Soon after, the film center was home to The Amazing Show, a production which hired an all-trans cast and sold tickets predominantly, predominantly to Korean tourists. In 2009, the lease expired, and for the past 10 years, the place has remained empty. We see Paradise scan the cultural center, some of its outdoor space now used for neighborhood joggers, some for people in need of public space in an overcrowded and overpopulated metropolis. She scans the now disused sign reading Amazing Show. She floats through the empty and abandoned archways. It seems she's looking for something. And as she's doing that, she recites a silent meditation in this graveyard built to look like the Parthenon. She's doing a spiritual sweep to finally let them know that it's okay to move forward, that they don't need to be in this in-between space, that she is there to carry them over, or at least to send messages to the living that they are now calm. Paradise herself is a character caught between places. She, she sympathizes with them. She lives in the past and in the future simultaneously. In lives before, she has been uprooted and forced to leave at home. But in all the new places she finds herself in, she is able to adapt. She is even able to thrive. She searches for these similar places and people. She is summoned by collective consciousness and by shared experience. Kami sa kalimliman, na 
punto ng pagkakaisa mula sa self-form. Subukang magkaroon ng katawan. Again in the Philippines, Paradise has found herself in Bataan, a province in central Luzon, amongst a new neighborhood of Spanish colonial houses called Las Casas Filipinas de Acuzar. Las Casas is a 400 hectare seaside resort built by developer Jose Acuzar, located on one side of Manila Bay, approximately a three hour drive from Manila. We drive up in the van after sitting through a bit of rough Manila traffic and then through some countryside and suddenly, almost out of nowhere, like an apparition, Las Casas appears. The website reads, be transported to old Manila's glory days, the moment you set foot at Las Casas Filipinas de Acuzar, home to Jose Acuzar's collection of restored Spanish Filipino houses, this resort in Bagac, Bataan is a reflection of Filipino craftsmanship intricately curated into a world-class historical haven, speckled with classic architecture, grandiose landscape, and spectacular waterworks. There is surely beauty to behold everywhere. Our van enters through an old gated archway and we are greeted by resort staff dressed in colonial costume. It, is, it indeed looks like a perfect colonial village replete with tramvias, Manila's old transport system, cobblestone roads, and antique street, lamp, street lamps. We check in and are taken to our hotel building, which overlooks an ornate plaza, which holds a couple of stone fountains, each containing water buffalo statues. After dropping our things off, we get a tour of Las Casas. Our guide, a young, fair-skinned Filipino woman dressed in colonial fashion, picks us up and ferries us around the grounds. All employees are encouraged to speak a modified version of Filipino. They are trained to speak in an affected way, a way that more reflects the Spanish colonial era language. All of the houses are intensely beautiful and ornate. Acuzar started collecting these houses almost 20 years ago. He finds these houses most of the time crumbling, buys them up, disassembles them, transports them from their original environments, and then meticulously reassembles them with the help of locals from Bataan. There are a total of 27, there are a total of 27 colonial houses at Las Casas, with, with 23 more set to be rebuilt. Acuzar has brought an immense economy to this once very sleepy fishing village. He employs hundreds of locals and has carved out an interesting tourism niche based on his love and obsession with these buildings. But why erect a colonial past or one that is highly idealized? During the, during the conquista, the first task of colonization was the reduction or relocation of the indigenous population into settlements surrounding the plaza. There remains an, there remains an omission at Las Casas that Paradise is looking for. She scans the old but newly restored architecture, searching for a portal to another reality, which presses just against this one. She is here because she can sense this very strongly. She can make out a village where the Las Casas main plaza is and senses her parallel world counterparts, advising everyday life. In the wake of the movement of such ornate buildings, souls have gotten lost and are disoriented. She's now trying to shuffle them through this parallel world.
nakasandal sa gusaling pader, ang mga tao ay tumingala. Nakita nila akong lumitaw. Kung ang bilang ay sapat sa laki, ako ay tinawag. Sa ilalim ng mga tumbok na batong durog. Pagkatapos ng pagsabog, lumapit ako sa iyo. Here's a quote to end from Bobby Benedicto's essay, which this talk takes its name from, called Queer Space in the Ruins of Dictatorship Architecture. Abandoned places are not empty places, but the practice of abandonment creates a terrain vague. It provides room to maneuver, an opening, a gap in which new arrivals might create something unexpected, where new dreams might be crafted out of the remnants of ones that have been or might be forgotten. Indeed, ruins have traditionally drawn those who are, who, who are compelled by an inner voice or the outside world or both to fabulate their own place, to take fragments of the past and remember them into something other. <laughs>